Hey everyone, this is John Fennick with the Fennick Commodities Report. Uh, we've got a couple of great guests today. Our regular guest, uh, Don Durrett from goldstockdata.com. Hey, Don. How's it going, John? Thanks for having me back. Or, yeah, back of course. We always well, do this together. I guess we do this every two to four weeks, so it's really our, us, not me, uh, yeah. leading the way here. So, uh, But we also have Jeremy Wyeth today from, from Treasury Metals, a uh, very experienced CEO, um, has a great team in Canada behind him. So I'm excited to hear a little bit about what's happening there. Um, and uh, why don't we just kick it off on the macro side and talk a little bit about um, the price action we've seen here over the last couple of days. Yeah, so um, I'm, the big number really is the HUI. So the HUI was, it's went up 15 points in two days. Um, finally is getting a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of a bounce. People, you cannot can't ignore it forever. It's like uh, the you know got gold over two twenty two hundred, um, you know twenty two twenty on on the spot twenty two forty two on futures. So we're over twenty two hundred here. I mean they the HY had to bounce, but it's still I mean it's still sub two fifty. And my perspective, anytime you're below two fifty on the HY, you're kind of in bearish territory. So. Mm -hmm. Until you get, you know, above 275, and I think it looks like if gold stays above 2200, we'll get there pretty pretty soon. But the high in the HUI back in August of 2020 was 360. 60, yeah. So we're way off. We're way off that, and we weren't at 2200 dollars back in, you know, back then. So the HUI still has a long way to go here, to you know, to move. So you know, I'm not, you know, I'm still not super excited about this. You know, we, we, we'll talk more about, you know, the economy, but just talking a little bit about the price action and the miners and, you know, is it time to, you know, go all in and, and you know, is this it off to the races kind of thing? Um, I still think that this is, you know, a technical rally in, in, in many respects for gold being that, I mean, yeah, people, the East is buying gold, but the West really isn't yet. And so, I mean, I don't see a lot of people talking about gold on Wall Street, for instance. I mean, they're not buying the miners. I mean, Newmont was at 29 recently and there was no volume at all. I'm like, if I was a rich person, I'd be buying the heck out of Newmont sub 30 because you're going to get a dividend. It's going to go up. It's, it's a, and, but nobody was buying it. There's no volume at 29. Now it's at almost 36. So it's kind yeah. of bounced off its bottom there. But um, so is, is it a fundamental rally? So I, my gut is that it isn't a fundamental rally because if what I want to see as an investor in gold and silver mining stocks is I want to see gold outperform the stock market. Because if you go back to 2000 to 2011, especially 2001 to 2005, gold was outperforming the stock market because the stock market, you had that recession in 2001 and gold was outperforming and the miners were outperforming. So you need that. And so right now, um, the, I mean, the stock market has been outperforming gold. And so we need that to flip. That's the fundamental change. And in order to get that, um, you got to have, I think you're, we're going to need some type of event that hasn't happened yet. And so for instance, the shock of, the dot-com bubble popping and, and the 9-11 coming right after it, the, the, the markets got really, you know, hit in the stomach there and got shocked. And gold basically started moving and, and it didn't stop moving until 2011. And so we need that to come back. So I'm still waiting for that event that makes this more of a fundamental move in gold than, versus a technical move in gold. So I'm not super excited yet about, OK, this is it, because I've been waiting for the once in a lifetime run where, you know, gold just kind of rips faces off and, and really just changes its whole dynamic where gold is bought not so much as insurance. It's actually bought as an investment opportunity. I'm going to make some money. FOMO. People FOMOing into silver to make money, FOMOing into gold to make money. That's a fundamental change. We haven't had that yet. And. and I'm waiting for that. And I think that's why silver's holding back here because silver really will take off and run once you get a fundamental change. So silver's telling you that it's the fundamentals aren't there yet for 
the metals to outperform the market. And that's what I want to see. Yeah. Okay. That's a lot of information there. And I agree with a lot of that. Um, I think, you know, we recorded at the end of February, a day after that analyst downgraded Newmont, and we were both like, you know, what the heck is going on here at 29 ish. And now we're at 3584 on Newmont just in a month. Right. So that's something positive to take away is that we're starting to see the largest holding in GDX finally catch somewhat of a bid. Um, and it's 12.8% of the ETF, right? So it's got to move for GDX to move. Um, and I think, you know, it's good, as we've talked about off camera, it's just going to be a cash flow generator at, at, at these kind of prices. So I don't understand what's holding back value managers for, for them to get excited about something like this, but you know, it's the only uh, mining stock in the S and P. So I think that's going to help you know, get a little bit of attention from money managers as we start to see the broad market step, sell off a bit, which we haven't seen yet, right? There's, it's been extremely resilient. That's been part of the big problem. That's holding back something like GDX or HUI here, in my opinion. Um, so um, I will comment though that the gold price closing at 2,200 plus on the monthly and quarterly. Huge. I think that's going to wake some people up over the long weekend here, bringing some fresh cash next week. Let's see if I'm right. But I think that um, a lot of people had their eyes on both the 2100 and 2200 levels <clears throat> on a on a quarterly close. And now that we're here, I think that might bring in some traders uh, to the sector next week. So we'll see what happens. Um, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about. Um, you know, just how wrong some of these banks have been about their calls on either gold or silver over the years. You know, back in 2016, I, you've been doing this about a decade longer than I have. But remember in 2016, January, when we had gold around 1050, 1075, you know, Wells Fargo had a price of 9, 950, somewhere in there. That was their annual price for 2016. Uh, I remember City had a price around 1025. I mean, and then gold just ripped, right? And the miners really ripped. Um, and I think that's kind of what is, you know, when I read this this uh, report this morning from BMO, BMO, um, they're talking about silver prices declining over the next three years into 2027 from here. So their average, I think this year is 2541 an ounce, but it gets really bad in 2027 to under 24 an ounce. And I put out a piece this morning to you and a lot of my paid followers and just said, you know, what the heck is going on here? You can't buy into this kind of rhetoric because when you look at, you know, analysts, you know, that I, I you know, we both have an analytical background, you know, um, if you're, if you're a big bank, are you going to put your best analyst on mining stocks? No offense, but you know, these, some of these people shouldn't even be in these roles. I don't think, I don't think they understand the upside, and this is their job, you know? I mean, do you have any thoughts on that? Right, um, <laughs> yeah, my, my opinion is that Wall Street um, dislikes gold and buy, you know, also silver, just because gold and silver are kind of correlated to a certain extent, but they mainly are anti-gold. I mean, um, <laughs> there was a guy yesterday, um, you know, the head of, the head CEO of BlackRock, um, think he's he actually had a quote yesterday saying, you know, that he he doesn't like gold because it hurts. He thinks it kind of hurts the economy because all people do is buy it and put it in a safe, and so it's kind of dead money. And and, and he's right to a certain extent because, you know, if you have ten thousand dollars and you know you buy it, you buy the gold, you go put it in the safe. Now, the guy that you gave the $10,000 to, does he go and invest it in the stock market? No, possibly. Um, but, you know, the, but the person who bought the gold, it was an asset. So he had an option. Did, did he buy, does he want to buy gold? Does he want to buy another asset? So Larry Fink wants him to buy another asset. He doesn't want him to buy gold and put it in a safe. And then he's not investing any more money. Um, so, but the analyst on Wall Street for gold, and silver. I mean, that that's Siberia. You don't want to do that. You and 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 you don't want to be pro, you know, bullish on gold. You want to get out of Siberia and you want to get a job somewhere else in the, in the company. Like you said, that's not where you want to be because it's it's you know it's not an area that the company is really excited about. That's not where they're pushing their clients to. So 
you know, they have a bias against it, and I can see why. It's it's it competes against stocks and bonds. I mean, that's the bottom line. It competes against the dollar. So, you know, for them to put these ridiculous numbers out, you know, twenty four dollars silver in twenty twenty seven, and that's that's hilarious, right? Um, I, I it's more of a comedy show, but they're all they're, I ignore their numbers. Um, I never really give them any credence, but. Let's let's really look at the calls that they're making that I think that they're way, way off. The the economists that work on on Wall Street. Um, you know, sure. I think that the reason why gold is, you know, doing well right now is it, it I think it is getting a bit of a, a technical trade, whereas it's kind of the everything bubble, everything's kind of getting pushed up and you know, gold's coming along for the ride, if you will. But then you have a lot of bank. The central banks are buying gold, and Asia's buying gold. But the West, I don't think the West is buying gold yet, um, because they're more than happy of making 20% on their money in the stock market. And so mm -hmm. that's where you know where they're where they're basically putting their money. Gold's a risk off trade, and right now Wall Street's in the risk on mode. I mean, we're 18 month. We're in an 18 month rally basically. And they're calling it a six month rally, but we went a year. I mean, it started in October of 22 uh, and, and went all the way through 23. So it, it's really yeah. an eight month rally here. And so what I think, you know, they're really, I, I'm really pessimistic around the economy. And I think that we're going to get, this, I think this is going to be a very, very ugly year economically. Nobody thinks that way. We're off to a very calm start. Um, Wall Street's very excited. I mean, they're basically having a party on Wall Street. Um, most stocks are up 10% on the year and 20% over six months. You know, they're making money and everybody's happy. And, and basically, they see these cuts coming and think everything's fine. And I, I think the house is on fire and they just don't, they, they haven't smelled the smoke yet. That's the way I feel about it. And it really, I, I think it's a very, very serious situation here. Now, I don't listen to Peter Schiff that much. Um, I have in the past, but you know, I don't anymore. But he's one of the guys that's out there basically just, you know, he gets a lot a lot of play, right? He's one of the sure. ones kind of I'm kind of in that camp. I mean, he's really pessimistic like I am. Um, and he's basically he's been trying to let people know. The other one, Jeffrey Gunlock, is another guy that basically sees the recession coming. And he, yep. he's pointing, you know, he's he's putting out some really good charts and pointing to it, but there really isn't. I, I don't think right now there isn't really a lot of people that are basically saying that you know this is going to be actually a very, a very, very bad year. So now, if you look at the U.S. economy, if you look at look at its fundamentals, it's really gotten really, really weak. Um, over, you know, since 2000, if you will. So we got basically 24 years, it's a long time, 24 years of weakness. I mean, the only reason why the economy has grown is because they had artificially low interest rates and in, in printing money. I mean, we basically exploded debt to $34 trillion. We're adding a trillion dollars every three to four months right now. Yes, and that yeah. money is counted as GDP. If you take that deficit down to 500 billion, we're in a recession right now. Um, the, the, so, the, it, and here's the big problem. This is why I'm really, really pessimistic, and I just think things are going to break here. And, and I don't know if gold is going to be. I don't know how far down gold is going to go. It's great at 2200, but I still think we go back below 2000 when this when this event comes. The, the this I don't know what I don't know what it's going to cause it, but here's the. I'll finish with this idea. The, the bottom line is this, is that the U.S. Treasury can only borrow so much money. There's only so many buyers out there. Now, one, one, now one of the buyers, of course, is the Fed. The Fed can come in and say, OK, you know, I'll, your auction, I'll cover the rest of it. But right now, the, the Fed doesn't, isn't trying to expand their balance sheet. They're trying to contract it, QT. So... This year, I don't, they're, they're basically, they're going to have to flip. But what I think is going to happen, I actually think, in, in, in Wall Street, they think this is ridiculous. They laugh at me, right? But I actually think that the Treasury market, the U.S. Treasury market, is actually going to break this year. And what I mean by that is they're not going to be able to borrow as much money as they want to borrow. 
So you go into recession. Whenever you go into recession, the deficit goes up. And the interest on our debt already is a trillion dollars. So they can't cut that. That's a, they have to pay it, right? They have to pay defense. They have to pay Medicare. Well, basically, they're not going to cut anything, right? But on top of the deficit that we already have, which is at least $1.5 trillion, is you're, when you go into recession, the amount of money the government has to spend increases. And there's nothing they can do about it. It's all built in. And, and that's how recessions work, is if, if the states need unemployment money, they get the Fed has to give them a check. There's nothing they can do. They, oh, no, sorry, you're in uh, recession. No, you can't have any money. That's not how recessions work. They, the government has to write the check and send the money to the states. And, and basically, every time you have a recession, the deficit expands. It's, just na it's a natural unfolding. So when the recession begins this year, which I think it will, the treasury market is going to blow up because they're not going to be able to borrow what they want to borrow. And everybody's going to know it. So they're going to want to borrow, for instance, like $200 billion in one month. And, mm -hmm. and there's not going to be enough buyers. And that's and when that happens, all hell's going to break loose. I don't know the ramifications on that. But so they got that going on. The other thing you have going on is the Fed is totally trapped here. And nobody's really talking about it. So you got these two factors that are massive, absolutely massive. And everybody's in denial thinking everything's fine, right? Okay, so I talked about the treasury market blowing up. But what's even is just as bad as that, and that's awful, awful, right? Is the Fed has never, ever been constrained on what they wanted to do to address the economy. So... You go back to, let's say we go back to, um, I don't know, in a world of two. Let's just go to 1945 forward. The Fed, whenever there was a recession, they had the tools to do whatever they wanted to do. They get around in a meeting, a boardroom meeting, and decide what they wanted to do, and they did it. There was no, they were proactive. Well, right. what's about to happen for the first time ever in history is they're going to get around that table, and they're basically going to say, we can't do what we want to do. And they're, that's going to be historic. And they're, they're going to go into reactive mode. And then the only and then this is this, this is when it's going to get really nasty because Wall Street's going to realize that the Fed, oh, my goodness, they can't print four trillion. They can't lower rates to one percent. They can't do what they want to do. The, the Fed is the emperor with no clothes. And that's the tipping point. So those two things are going to happen this year, I believe. And so that's one of the reasons why, you know, I want to see this fundamental move, because once that happens, the fear trade is going to explode. And when the fear trade explodes, gold will start outperforming the stock market. And that's what we need. Now, maybe gold's leading here. We're going to find out when that event comes how far <laughs> gold goes. But I think we go back sub 2000. And uh, I think 1900 is going to hold here, 1920, 1950. But... Mm -hmm. You know, most of the TA guys think I'm nuts. And there's no way we're going back below 2,000. We're off and running here. But I, I think we do. And that's uh, a lot of information as well. And I totally agree with your, your gold assessment because think about what happened, as you had mentioned, in October of 22, right? I don't know too many guys that were calling for 1610, 1615 gold. That happened. And so then we skyrocketed off of that low, right, all the way to 2,000 plus. But, um, you know, this isn't a straight line up. I think we're seeing FOMO buying in multiple sectors right now. That's um, one of the reasons that we actually dialed back our recession call, um, you know, gosh, May of last year. When I started to see tech and AI really taking off, I was like, wow, this, this rally is real for now. But I still think that we have a good shot at the second half of this year. Um, for that to unfold, um, because the greed that we're seeing in the broad markets right now and in stuff like Bitcoin, I mean, I, I just never witnessed anything like this. There's nothing to compare this period of time to in history, right? I mean, some would argue 99 to 2000, but you and I were both around for that. I was in the field for that, working with billion dollar teams. And I remember, you know, the day that AOL got a thousand dollar price target on it. And that was like the bell ringing of like, this is the high, right? I think, I think we're, approaching that really soon like the old saying you know selling may and go away that could happen this year right you could see people late may on the wall street just say i'm gonna take a nice summer with my family and 
then what happens, right? Like when we start seeing some some geopolitical risk perk up, uh, people are just not prepared, I don't think. And I, I think that's one of the reasons we're seeing, um, you know, if you look at February of 22, Don, that was the beginning of the Russia-Ukraine conflict. And that's when central bank buying really started to accelerate. If you look at China and, and how much gold they've consumed since that time, it's, it's enormous. Um, the, num the numbers just came out a few, like, I think this week. Um, so, you know, they, they, China doesn't really show its hand a lot on a lot of different levels. And to see those numbers, it's like, hmm, you know, the Chinese are pretty discerning when it comes to price on gold. And now they're just buying it because they have to. And I think that's what's going to happen with retail. It's like, hey, where were you at 1800, 1900? You know, now it's 2200. And there's going to be some type of catch up trade. And I also think the same for silver. I mean, the silver to gold to silver ratio right now, I believe is right around 90 uh, when I looked yesterday, which is insane. I mean, every time you hit 90, I know I've said this two other times, but I'm going to say it a third because I think our listeners need to know this. Every time you hit gold to silver ratio of 90, which is the ounce of gold divided by an ounce of silver, you know, going back to the 1980s, it has been a buy on silver and or silver equities every single time except once, you know? I mean, that is like an amazing batting average. So that's why we've been buying silver names here, you know? Um, I just think you have to, hold your nose and buy on some of these some of these stocks right um i i, I think that when the war started in, in the ukraine i just think that was the trigger for gold it hasn't happened yet but we're, that was when i really think that well the bull market actually started in 2019 when we broke out above 1400 i mean if you look at the chart it just went from yep. 1400 and just kept going up so I, I just think, think that's when the gold bull market really began. But the Ukraine war was really the event that came after that basically said it's not kind of we're not going back. It was it's going to be a long one. So we, we've had two long bull runs, 1971 to 1980 and then 2001 to 2011 had those two big bull runs in, in gold. And that's when gold was outperforming the market. Right. And so. I think we're entering that period. The thing that's amazing is that we're actually going to be entering that period where we're, we're actually going to break out here. This is actually a breakout at an all time high, which it's usually the other way around. You usually start really, really low. We started at $35 in 1971. And we started at $250 in 2001. So now we're starting at 22,000. It's kind of crazy. We're starting at this very, very high level. So how far is this thing going to go? But I think it's early. I think this is really the beginning of it. But but th that fundamental thing, I think, is coming. And when that comes, look out. Now, the reason why I think China has been accumulating all, all this gold is because they, they want to do more trade with the yuan. But if they, they do trade in yuan, the other countries, they want to settle in gold. And then they can take that gold and convert it back to their currency. And so I think international trade is a big reason why they're accumulating all this gold because they, especially oil, if you want to settle, oil is like very expensive. So if you're going to settle oil for gold, you got to have a lot of it. So, yeah. so I think that's a big play there. And I think that's going to be pushing gold up, up, up. Oil and gold, this commodity, this commodity bull market that's just starting here are two, you know, oil and gold are two big players in the commodity field. And I think this is early innings on that as well. And so, and, and this is all, it doesn't help you, the U.S., um, you know, with China trying to move away from U.S. treasuries, try, and they have been, and trying to move away from the dollar. This is, a bit, this is a big paradigm shift. And I think that, like I said, the Ukraine war was kind of the trigger for, for it all. And Washington, not Washington, Wall Street is in denial of this paradigm shift that's occurring uh, it's like an earthquake under our feet and they can't feel it. And um, like I said, I think this year is going to be a very traumatic year. So you had 2016 with Trump coming in and in 2020 you had COVID. 2024 is going to be the economic earthquake, you had the political earthquake. And then you had that COVID, you know, kind of virus earthquake. And now you're going to get your economic earthquake this year. That's that's what I'm expecting. Hang on, you know, hang on to your seats because it's going to get bumpy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I totally get it. Uh, and uh, 
when you look at the U.S. election in November, I mean, we're only, uh, what, eight months away, less than eight months, and there's going to be a lot of drama coming up to that. So um, with that, why don't we pause it there on the macro side and uh, introduce Jeremy Wyeth uh, from Treasury Metals. Uh, hey, Jeremy, how you doing today? Hey, John, good to be with you guys. Interesting sitting and listening to uh, to what we can expect for the year. <laughs> yeah, we... Uh, we, we, we started this last July, right, Don? So, you know, we both um, have been doing uh, something in the precious metal space for a long time, Don, about a decade longer than myself. So, um, you know, I, I, I value these opportunities to work with someone like Don. And, and uh, Jeremy, you know, you're, you're a pick that both Don and I uh, own and, and we believe in. And uh, I wanted to start, you know, rather than go through a formal presentation today, I wanted to start with asking you about your PFS that you you launched quite a while ago, because you know when you look at the um, prices that you you know were using at that time, they're much much lower than today's prices for something like gold. So can you tell us to start off, you know, when that report was, what the net present value was of the project in in Canada at that time, and what you think it might be based on today's prices, please. Yeah, John, we we put it out about April last year, and at that stage, uh, it was consensus for people to use 1750 gold in most of the financial models. So, at 1750 gold, we were at 336 million NPV and a 25.4 percent IRR. Okay. If we if we just we always used to run a sensitivity on that and we used to run it up to 1950 gold but with the way things are going now we've run it at 2150 gold and we're sitting at 650 million nav and a 41 percent irr and if we take it up to, to today's prices to spot we're over 700 million nav and a 44 percent irr so you know, I was very happy with the numbers last year um, at 1750. I thought it was a really robust product uh, project. But the the good thing for us is it's very well leveraged to gold price. So as gold goes, and I'm 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 a believer, Don. I'm I'm listening and I'm waiting for it to go. Um, you know, we're very well leveraged to that. So. You know, at 2150 gold, John, this is this this project is really looking very, very strong. Thanks for sharing that update. Um, another thing that I wanted to to, uh, to ask about, because, you know, when you talk about the price of a stock divided by the net asset value, so that is known as P to NAV um, in, in the industry. You know, your your shares seem to be so undervalued versus some other gold uh, names that I track. Could you give us like an idea of what the average in the junior sector might be for a price to nav uh, and, and and what yours is currently, please? If we look at our peer group and we we take an analyst consensus P to nav and we put it in our deck all the time, we're sitting at about 0.07. And okay. the industry average, at, sorry, in our in our developer peer group, the industry average there is about 0.19. So we're about a third of the industry average. And some of the people in that in that group run up to close to 0.4. So the average about 0.2, we're at 0.07. Um, you know, if you look at um, enterprise value per measured and indicated ounce, we less than $10 an ounce. And there you're sitting with an average of our peer group again of 35. So I get asked all the time, why is this? And I think, and I think Don, we spoke about this at Beaver Creek a few, was it last year? You know, I think both the projects that we put together in 2020 were were underfunded in their history. They were both too small to build. They'd both been around. Uh, Goldland was a, a previous producer in the 80s. And Treasury Goliath has been around since uh, it's about 15 years now. And it's always just been too small. And I think I think we 
we're still battling some of that history that the projects have been too small, they've been around and people have, have lost interest in them. Putting the two together gave us that critical mass, more than a million ounces, 100,000 a year, 10 years of, of, of life. And it was interesting listening to the rationale around what's happened over the last while because we've seen gold pick up, but we haven't seen that link into into the developers. The people making money right now are the producers, but that link in, and we're starting to see more and more. We saw, you know, a, a, a company taken out this week, one of the mines that's just been built. We're starting to see that. I think people are looking at it and saying, I want production, so I'm going in. If I look around now, there are not a lot of other mines being built, and we must be very close to being the next one in to get permits and get this going. So, it, and I know using logic is often a fatal flaw, but if you look at it, there should be something that gets this re rate going and recognition for the state we're at, the infrastructure we're on the size of the resource, just this is this is not a difficult mine to build. This is a mine in some of the best infrastructure I've ever seen. Um, we've put a team together, we can build it. We just need something to change in the markets right now. You know, at a 20, 27, 28 million market cap, it's tough to raise $350 million. But if you look at it at today's value of over 700 million NAV, it, yeah. th there's something missing in this that just doesn't fit together. I know, I know what it is. <laughs> are you are you done, John? You had another question? Yeah, I just I have one follow up comment on. Um, are you referencing Argonaut, the deal this week, Jeremy? Yes. Yes. Yeah. You know that that's uh, not far, right? I mean, um, that's close to Wawa. It's close to Wawa and it's not that far from us. I mean, we're in a belt, that whole Northwestern Ontario belt is historically 60 million ounces of production. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a huge gold belt um, for us. You know, we need 320 square kilometers, 65 kilometers of strike, and we've probably drilled five of the 65 kilometers. And that's because, you know, historically you sit with this thing of, the projects were too small. All the money was concentrated on the main resource. What yeah. we've tried to do now is build this out, but we're in a tough spot because at today's prices and valuations, raising money is really dilutive to shareholders. So, you know, I came on to, to start the process of getting ready to build this. I've worked on mines where each year you grow the resource by what you deplete. So you do it out of cash flow. So we've got that opportunity forward. Right now, I, the next value stage for us is permits and IBAs. So that's where our funding is going at the moment. And I'm reluctant to go and raise much more money on the drilling side. Although this project, this property is definitely not target poor. We have so many really good targets that that I'd love to get into, and you know if things pick up and we can, that will be great. But I also am really cognizant of shareholders saying at today's prices, diluting to go and do that when you can build it. It's big enough to build now, so let's let's move that. Let's move in that direction. So it's this dilemma you sit with, and and Don, we chatted about that at Beaver Creek. You know, what do you do? Do you put more into drilling? Do you put less into drilling? Do you do no drilling? I've got some shareholders that want us to only drill. I've got others that say don't spend any money on drilling. So it's this this difficult position. Yeah, I'm in the yeah. latter. I, I don't think you should spend any money on drilling. Me um, too. <laughs> so to give people an overview of, of your project, because maybe not everybody's aware of it. So it's in a really good location in Canada. They have a market cap of $22 million, 3 million ounces of, of gold. So yeah, less than about $8 an ounce in the ground, which is kind of crazy. It's an advanced project. They have a PFS on it. They're working on permits. And then after the permits, and they do the DFS. So very advanced. Um, just a quick question for you, Jeremy. When do you think you're going to finish the permits and the IBAs? 
Don, we are, at the moment, our, our scheduling is taking us to the middle of next year. So it's at the start of this year, it was about 18 months. It's now probably 30, um, 15 months to get there. It's, and that is, we, we already have a federal EA on the project. So, and that was done for the Goliath property. Now that we've put Goldland on, we need to do an amendment to that, but that's procedural. It's not a big change. Um, and then it's about, from from when we started at the beginning of the year, it's about an 18 month period to get the, the permits, the provincial permits. And then our anticipation is to have IBAs within that same time frame. So round about mid next year, we should be in a position where we're looking to, um, to get uh, project financing done and get into a construction decision. Okay. Um, so yeah, that was an important one. So I thought I would mention that. So you can see um, the very advanced project. It really um, has just one, you know, massive red flag, and that's you know how do you finance uh, a three hundred fifty million dollar capex when your market cap is only twenty two? And because if you do, you can't do equity financing of that kind of magnitude so I, I mean jeremy i mean it seems like you're behind the eight ball that you know no bank is going to you know give you a big loan unless you know you can show them equity you know do and you know they want to see equity they want you to do that financing um unless you you know you can show them you know 100 million in equity they're not going to give you a big loan so i mean aren't you kind of trapped here at 22 million fully diluted don't, the way the markets are right now, I think we we exactly where the rest of our peers are. We've we've already looked at the debt capacity and we're finding we can probably bring 200, 250 million of debt capacity to this. But you're right, we need that equity piece. Um, at a at a market cap of 25 million, it's going to be very very tough to pull the equity piece in. Um, we need to see something change. We are seeing a lot of consolidation at the moment. Um, you know, we need to see something change in the markets. We need to see something move on the consolidation side or something like that to get us into a position where we can. You know, we have the opportunity on equipment financing to take something off that equity piece, but you're right, we are still looking at probably 80 to 100 million dollars of equity that that we need to find. Um, what I am happy about is it's not today. Yeah. So right, yeah, if yeah. it was today, I'd be looking at you with probably with tears in my eyes saying it's not going to happen, but it's in 15 to 18 months time. So, yeah, sure. you know, when you talk about uh, that's what I really enjoyed that first part of your show there was just where things are going and what you're expecting. It's not like this project is, once it's up and running, once this project's built, it has a nav of about 1.3 billion. So once you've actually gone through and built it. So this is something that in my mind is going to get built. It's right. how do we get it across that finish line? The team I have in place are people that have done this before and we can build it. You know, we would love to do that, but it's yeah. all going to depend on factors. And I'm really hoping that, as you said, gold is going to run. We're going to see a re-rate. We're going to see things change within the the markets that allows us to be there. Right. I, I have you. You guys have a really strong insiders. So, you know, if somebody tries, for instance, I mean, your company is so cheap right now. Anybody that if somebody paid 100% premium, they would still be stealing it, you know, paying, you know, $40 million for your company, US, it would still be a s absolute steal because of the quality of the project. Um, so, but you have high insiders and I have you like at 50%. So I'm sure, I mean, people, you're probably, I would think you're currently not for sale. And if anybody calls you on the phone, you basically say, we're not for sale. I is that correct? Look at, <laughs> We, we're looking at, we'll never turn down people wanting to chat to us. So we're always looking at opportunities. 
I think at this stage as a CEO, I'd be remiss if I wasn't entertaining and looking at different things. But you're right. I mean, it is an absolute steal. We do have in our top three shareholders own about 40% of the company. So we are in a good position there. And to be honest, those are the people that two of the three have actually been our strongest supporters over the last while. So they have a lot um, of interest in seeing the project going forward. Right. Um, it, it, as far as, sorry for interrupting, but as far as yeah. talk, talking, absolutely. I mean, I mean, I think that is really the path forward. So there's two different types of partnerships, but you don't want to, you don't want to sell the company, but a partnership absolutely could work depending yes. on what the partnership is. But I mean, if, if somebody came in and, you know, with a whole bunch of, you know, cash, um, you know, if, if they were going to fund, you know, the majority of the CapEx, if you, okay, we'll give you 50% of the project, but you have to pay for 75% of the CapEx. I mean, that's pretty tasty, right? But the, but that's one way. I wouldn't mind that, but because, I mean, 50% of this project is going to be worth a lot. Um, like you said, NAV of one point something billion dollars, and you're currently valued at 20 million. So if you, if you go up to 500 million, it's a pretty good return for shareholders. Now, but what I would prefer, I mean, that's one way to do it. But, uh, well, the other way, I guess, is very similar. And that would be what Benchmark and Thesis recently did. So you had two development projects, and they basically were kind of in the same situation that you're at. They just neither are getting very much equity, and they decided just to combine the companies, but they did it on, e on an equal basis. So there was no dilution. Nobody paid anything. Um, and there was uh, some synthesis there. So you, you basically, it makes it easier to finance the project. So, um, so th that those are your, I think those are two pretty good options for you, right? You could find another, find another company instead, um, instead of just um, kind of doing a JV, but you could actually combine the company together with somebody else. Are there Correct. And I mean. Like I think there is a danger, though, that and I know the market looked at some last year where the companies came together and they were two developers, both needed money, both hungry, you know, and the market looks at this and says, OK, well, now you've got twice the the capital requirement and you've you're just a, a slightly bigger company. So I think there's a danger in that. To me, you need the value in in these sort of things is can you find a pipeline so do you have our project is close to being shovel ready so but then do you have something behind that that is that you to me the value in these things is you build one you keep that same team and you build the next one you keep that same team and you build the next one so you you bulk yourself up so that you can get to where the equity is accessible. But I'll be honest with you, I think one of the reasons we've seen so many uh, not so successful bulls recently is because a lot of those bulls are new teams put on every time. And what we don't see a lot of, and I know in the old days, I know Placid did this, Inco did this, they used to build a mine every couple of years and they kept the same team doing it and they became really efficient at doing that. So I think, you know, to your point, yes, put things together. But if you've got two that are together that both need money at the same time and you don't get a lot of synergies in the teams and how you can do it, it's not necessarily the most efficient. But if you can find that pipeline and build that, um, absolutely. And that's what we, you know, we're spending a lot of time looking for those types of opportunities that gives you the opportunity to reuse the same team. Right. OK, um, yeah, I, I've always been excited about your potential because I I like uh, projects in Canada. I like big projects. Like you said, you have a lot of exploration potential to, to grow the company. Um, it's been a it's been a really long ride. You guys have been around. I've had you guys in my portfolio for a long time. Yeah. Um, but now I, I can start to see the finish line here. Um, and. Yeah, I, I'm really excited about the fact that your top three shareholders own 40 percent. And if they're all on the same page, um, they're going to make sure 
that this project gets built and that shareholders get rewarded. So yeah. that, that's a big positive. I think that's probably the best takeaway from this is that even though you guys are kind of behind the eight ball here is trying, trying to raise money, um, you still have strong shareholders, a strong project in a good location that needs to get built. It will get built. It's just a matter of how and who does it. But so we just have, you know, we get to the middle of the summer. We're not that far. I mean, we're spring here. You know, we get to the middle of summer. We're basically going to be a year out. Correct. And so, you know, we're starting to get closer and closer to um, a construction decision, which is really exciting. So I'm, I'm glad we had you on today. I'm, I'm more bulled up than it was. I'm, I'm going to add some more shares here um, next week. Um, you guys, are, I mean, you're trading 11 cents US. I'm, it's ridiculous. I, I'm definitely going to add some more here. I just don't think you can get any cheaper. It's like uh, a lot of these companies right now are just giving their companies away. And so, you know, smart investors like me and John, we're, we're going to take advantage of it. It's like, fine, you're going to get, you're going to give it to us. We'll take it. But um, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is so cheap. You're right. It's, it's, but you know, that's, we need, we need gold to move. We need people like yourselves to say, listen, we really believe in this. We've got three strong shareholders that are, you know, own a solid chunk that want to see this built. So those are the steps that are coming together. And, you know, it's, it's a great opportunity. It will be built. I don't have any doubt in my mind, this will be built. It's, we need a few things to change in the markets right now just to give us that assistance. There's, as I said earlier, what what we're looking at is the next major, I believe the next major value add for us is having permits and IBAs, because then you've got a project that will have a feasibility, permits, IBAs. I mean, yeah. I, with, if, if gold is running, that's the perfect time to jump in and build it. I, right. I. I... <laughs> think you guys should be patient and I think what you're going to need to do I, I don't even if your company rises to 50 million 60 million by the middle of next year which is a possibility I still think you're going to have trouble financing that capex but I think what makes a lot of sense here is you're going to get a lot of phone calls because people are going to start getting excited you know about beginning the gold mining business when the price of gold goes up so let's say we're at you know twenty five hundred dollar gold next summer, which I think is a very good possibility. If you guys are patient and wait for the right deal, but I think the right deal is you want somebody to pay in order to get half the half of the project. I think you guys want to be the operator though. You want to build it and be the operator. But if, some, but if somebody wants an equity interest in your company, they're like, look, you know. We'll give you 50%, but you're going to have to, you know, come up with a big chunk of this capex. So people are, it's basically going to all be about negotiation. But if you can get somebody to write a big check, I think it makes a lot of sense. You just don't want to, like today, it doesn't make sense because they wouldn't, they wouldn't give you very much money. But it, next yeah. summer, I think you might, somebody might come up with a really big check. Yeah. I mean, you might get, a, you might get a strategic um, investor as well. Um, you know, it's not a company, right? And just an investor uh, might come up with a big, say, okay, I want a big chunk of your company. That that could happen. That would be good. Yeah. That, that I would prefer that a strategic investor, but I, it's probably, but it's probably going to be another miner. You know, if a if a if a miner comes up, a mid tier or, or senior comes in, typically they want to build themselves, so yeah. they would come in and they'd take it and they would build it. I'm good with that because I think that'll give shareholder value. I mean, if I had to be selfish in this, I'd like a process that allows the team we have to build it because it's taken me three years to build that team. And I, I think they they really have the skill sets. But, you know, Don, this is this is not a market where where we can be picky and choosy here. We we will look and see what the options are. And if the best option for the shareholders and the company is that a senior or a mid-tier comes in, well, then so be it. I okay. like the idea, though, of someone to write a big check, a strategic or someone to come in that can be part of a process with us and allow us to build it. Yeah. Okay. All right. So okay. if you, 
sorry, one, go ahead, Justin. One last thing. So if, if you did that, if, if you basically kept half the company and let somebody come in and build it, your free cash flow um, would be fairly significant. I think, um, what I had the, the first, the, oh, okay, it the would first, be about 100 and let me let me say it would be about 150 million dollars at three thousand dollar gold at a hundred thousand ounces per production at break even of 1500. So your ASIC right now is 1100. So if I pump that ASIC up to 1300, um, 1500 break even, your free cash flow for your for you would be 75 million dollars. Um, a year that you could take if you kept your company intact. Now, again, this is a three thousand dollar gold long term. But if you kept your company intact at seventy five million, that's a lot of free cash flow. You could go out there and, um, you know, find another project, but build build, build another mine and, and basically b build your company up off, and off of that free cash flow. Is that is that something you want to do? Absolutely. I think we've looked at that. I mean, we, you know, the first five years, and, and if we talk 1750 gold, the first five years, we're putting out post tax free cash flow of $106 million a year at 1750 gold. So as wow. you go up, you can see that number increasing significantly. And that's, that's important for us. We looked at the first five years because that's when you're getting into your payback. That's when you're getting into all of those things. That also, Don, includes all the sustaining capital for putting the underground in at, at Goliath. So right. this thing really does produce good free cash flow. And, you know, the idea is if you, and this is why I said to you, you bolt a few together, you build this one, you use your cash flow to be part of building the next one, you then use the cash flow from the two to build the third one and you slowly put yourself into a situation where you can go to becoming a mid-tier producer half a million ounces a year out of three or four good projects that right now are being given away right right yeah so if you um if you can get free cash flow of let's say four forty million dollars a year if, if gold prices are at 16 um, 2500 somewhere around there you're mul you're in Canada so your multiple is going to be at least a 10 in my opinion it gives you a valuation of 400 million dollars and you're currently at 20 um, and um, that is if you only own half of the company yeah <laughs> <laughs> so so even if you only own half you you could be worth 400 to 500 million dollars now the key here is how much if they pay for the capex you're in great shape because you don't have to dilute, you don't have to dilute yourself into the ground. So that that 400 million valuation actually is a realistic number if you don't have to, you know, put a bunch of skin in the game to build this mine. So that that looks fantastic. That's yeah. that's, all, that's that's all I got, John. My <laughs> <laughs> no, you're good, Don. Um, hey, Jeremy. Um, uh, I I think the um, the market is obviously disconnected here between the price of gold, you know, clients see this all the time and, and a stock like yours that, you know, is, is a, a gold play. And, um, you know, I, I know it must be extremely frustrating for you as someone who's been in the mining space for a lot of years. And uh, I would just say, hold in there and don't do a deal at even this price. I think things by the time next year, um, when you really need to do a deal, you know, uh, as summer of next year, as you say, um, prices are going to be not only higher, however, you're going to see private equity, hedge funds, a lot of new money coming into the space. Uh, because Don and I were talking off camera about, you know, this rise in the gold price is going to get the attention of generalist investors at some point. We're not there yet, but I think by the time you really need to do this next year, we'll be there. Yeah. No, absolutely. It's you're right, John. It is frustrating, but you know, there's certain things we can control, and there are others that we can't. So right now, our focus is on the things we can control, which is permits, IBAs, and the feasibility, and that's what we're doing. Heads down. Yeah, it's frustrating, but there's a bigger prize out there, and that's getting to that finish line and being able to to take this thing to the next steps. And I think, you know, Don had some good ideas there on how to do that. Absolutely. Excellent. Well, Jeremy, 
Yeah. Thanks a lot for coming on. Um, it's been a pleasure and um, we uh, will let you go here. Don and I are just going to probably do a little brief summary on your company for everyone. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks. Thank you very much, gents. Thanks for yeah. your time and uh, have a great weekend. Yeah. Thanks for being on, Jeremy. And uh, we'll have you back after you make the deal. There you next, go. Next summer. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, gents. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, Jeremy. So that's interesting, Don. Um, you know, one a couple of the things that I had in my notes here, not only, you know, the ridiculous metrics um, of, you know, Pete and Av at 0 0.07 right now. One of the things he didn't mention, the peer groups around 0 0.20, right, that he, he would consider peers. But when you look at the average, it's like 0 0.4 to 0 0.5. Like, so this thing's really undervalued, in my opinion. Oh, Secondly, yes. Secondly, they drilled only five of the 65 kilometers. Did you catch that? I mean, yeah. that's, that's, so when you're talking about, I know you brought up like maybe buying something else. I mean, they could just get more money in a better gold market, you know, do some financing, do something creative, bring in a strategic, as you said, and then drill their own property. I mean, like they don't need to really go crazy with something else. I mean, this thing has the potential to grow. Right. So, yeah, I, I think there's a, depending on what the price of gold does. So today, I mean, they can't do a partner today, but they need somebody to help pay for that capex. There's, I don't think, I don't think there's a path forward for them alone, um, because the capex is three hundred fifty million dollars. So I mean, even even if their market cap gets to sixty million, I think they're still a little short. But um, I think he's right that they're going to have to find a mid tier that wants to build it themselves, but they're going to need somebody. A lot of times these mid tiers, they just don't want to pay, you know, the market price <laughs> they're, today. They're getting everything on sale, so they don't want to pay the market, the actual market price. But I think that the, the market price for a development company like this, because of the location should be $50 an ounce in the ground, which is 4X what they're at right now. It's actually five X. They're under ten dollars an ounce. He said, "Yeah, five X." So I think that is where um, you know when when they go to do a deal, they need to say this is you know really how much. But it's yes. it's 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 going to be interesting to see if if somebody's going will write it that big of a check to take half of the project um, because you have they they you get to take the risk. You know the cost overruns. Most of these companies are vultures. I mean, they basically circle. They wait, wait for the companies are trapped. They'll wait. You know, Argonaut's a perfect example. You know, with Alamos. It was like they just circle and they wait until they're basically ready to. You know, last breath. Right. <laughs> their last yep. breath. They come in. Um, so the companies are going to wait until Treasury. You know, they get their permits. They're ready to build it. The bankers aren't there, and then everybody's. Everybody wants to build a mine. Nobody has patience. And they come in with these mm -hmm. low ball offers. And they're basically like, okay, you know, we'll we'll give you a hundred million dollars and we'll pay for a hundred million of the CapEx. Basically, they get the company for free. <laughs> they get half yeah. of it for free. All they're doing is paying for the CapEx. Treasury Metals has spent 10 years developing this project to get it construction ready. And this other company comes in and goes, okay, I'll pay for the CapEx and get half of the company. <laughs> And, and well, totally thing, I totally agree with what you're saying. One thing to point out, though, is that Jeremy and his team could build this. There's a lot of explorers and developers that have no clue or have no team really to do that. So I think that's cool. Um, I also think that um, Jeremy's a good leader. You know, he's not going to make a snap decision to uh, just bring in money right now and panic, right? Because that would be dilutive. Um, but I think at twenty four, twenty five hundred dollar gold potentially next year, right? Like you're looking at a much better situation for uh, mining companies like his. And I think he's got. I mean, the timeline does matter, right? And the timeline in this case actually might work out quite nicely. Yeah, um, it should. We, we have to wait. I, I do think it's. Um, I think it will go up like right now it's at 11 cents. I, I do think it will go up trend hot between now and next summer. I think it'll get into the 30s. 
I think I, I think it's a good investment here, and it'll get. I think it'll get his company will go up, you know, two x, three x here by by the time we get to next summer. Is, is unless gold goes goes crazy, right? But if gold stays under twenty five hundred, I don't. I think I don't think people are going to give this stock a lot of love because <clears> the <throat> uncertainty of you know what's going to happen. Can they build it? So I, I I don't think it's going to be a high flyer. You're you're basically it's kind of a long term. You're you're going to wait and see what kind of a deal they do. But I think it'll probably get into the 30s is my expectation. And then they make the deal. And then once they make the deal, this thing is worth, you know, it, it you know, it does it again. It goes up 2x, 3x again. So mm -hmm. you're looking at, you know, I think minimum 5x here and probably maybe 10x. Um, the key here is how much how much they have to dilute, how much how much skin do they have to bring to the table to finance this capex versus their partner? If the partner does two thirds, um, then you we're going to we're going to make more money. But yeah. if, if but if it's 50, if it's a 50 50 thing, then they're going to have to dilute pretty significantly, and we're not our upside is going to be squeezed a little bit. But I, I think this at this level, I mean, most people paid you know much more higher than 11 cents. So if you're buying now or you're you're adding shares or getting in now, I think I think this thing could easily go up three, three, five X or more because it's yeah. in the right place. It's a good project. It's well advanced. It doesn't have any red flags other than financing. It's kind of a slam dunk. It's got exploration potential. It's got a good team. It, it really does check all the boxes. It's got high insiders. I mean, yeah, I know you like that. I just know why. The only red flag so, yeah. is, is is the financing, and if they if they do the financing smartly, we're not going to get killed on this. So, I like I'm I'm going to add shares. I'm I I think it's going to work. Well, this will um, wrap it up for us. Um, you know, I I think it was a really good uh, interview today, good macro talk, and uh, we'll be back in April with another one. And um, in the meanwhile. Happy Easter to you and your family, Don. Thank you. Who, who do we have in April? I forget. Uh, no one lined up just yet, but we'll uh, we'll figure that out. We'll, there's not a <laughs> there's a long list of people that want to come on, so um, cool. I'm just trying to figure out the best type of opportunities for our listeners because there's just so many you know names out there that have even if they don't look like they have hair on them, then you look at Argonaut, right? And you're like, oh my gosh, I don't do this for you know, a takeout, like look at AGI's chart, right? Alamos, um, beautiful looking chart. And look at Argonauts, not so much, right? Like this is the problem with our sector is that we yeah. have to avoid things yeah. as much as we buy, you know? And I've never owned Argonaut and- uh, I, Yeah, I, I traded Argonaut for New Pacific Metals today because okay. Argonaut, the spin code is, is basically gonna be a dog. I mean, they just don't have anything. They have their their mines in Mexico. They want to close, and then they have the Florida Canyon mine, which has high costs. They're trying to fix, but I just see you know the Spenco. So I mean, you're going to get the value in Alamos, but the value in Alamos, I mean, you could sell it today. So you're giving up the Spenco basically. If you sell it today, you give up the Spenco because you get the Spenco for free. Um, but I I just don't want the Spenco. I just think that. You know, I don't. I think the management team is okay. I don't think. I don't think they have a bad management team. It's just the project. What they have left, there just isn't anything there that's juicy to me. And I'm like, okay, I'll just. I'd rather give it, give the Spinco away right now, and take that money and go ahead and invest it in something else. And mm -hmm. New Pacific has been completely obliterated. And right. it's one of the silver projects that I don't own. I, I want to own all the all the silver projects. So it was a good trade for me. Um, so that was that's how my how I came out. I, I thought the only way Argonaut did that deal is they they had no choice. That's the only thing that makes sense to me because it was a terrible deal. Yep. So um yeah, I mean I, I understand uh, that's something we talk about all the time with our clients and listeners is opportunity cost is is you know, here's my money at Argonaut and here's my money at New Pacific or something else like an aftermath silver like we talked about before, right? Aftermath had great news February 29th um, following our interview, um, which said that, you know, 99.9% .9 manganese battery grade, you know, it's like that is a game changer for the company. 
And yet the market hasn't even picked up on this. This is the beauty of our sector and also the frustrating part about our sector is like you, you can still a month later build a position in something like that. When I talked to Michael Williams, the founder, he said, that's the most critical news release we've ever had, you know, and, and it's like, yet New Pacific and Aftermath are still available for sale, right? Like this is, that's that, you know, when you look at ounces in the ground, I'd say New Pacific and Aftermath are two of the top 15 that I can, that I've identified. Yeah. Yeah. It's optionality is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, I hope Silver Corp. I mean, they 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 lost the or they walked away from the Or Corp. They didn't, and so now, I mean, they own 25% of New Pacific. Why don't they just acquire it and build it? You know, I. Yeah, that's it's a, one of the reasons I. It's a I really good it's a really good diversification for them, because yeah. it's it's actually more production than they're currently producing, because oh, yeah. New Pacific is like 12 million, 15 million ounces a year. So it's so it's more than they're currently producing. It's a really good diversification, and they own 25%. I mean, it's a it seems like a perfect match. What in the heck were they doing buying a gold mine in Africa when they have this silver mine? It's you know ready to be built. It makes no sense to me. So I, I'm hoping that Silver Corp acquires it. Yeah, I mean, they have a huge position in the stock. Um, I know that I know both teams very well. And I know that Dr. Fang, you know, was talking to me, let's see, 16 months ago, we were in Europe together. And I remember him saying to me, like, everyone wanted my stock, meaning New Pacific, at like seven bucks, you know, and now no one wants it at two bucks. And now it's under two bucks. Um, we're at a dollar twenty-five, dollar thirty. Yeah, I paid a dollar thirty. Yeah, I paid a dollar thirty. It's like insane. So they have some serious ounces in the ground and and yeah, they did a dilutive financing last fall, and that has been problematic, but that period of time has passed. So you have to look at those as opportunities, right? Companies need cash. It's just part of the industry. And then you can buy something on the cheap. Um, and uh, like we were saying with treasury metals, I mean, you look at those three shareholders owning 40% plus, uh, I bet they paid a heck of a lot more than 11 cents US. Yeah. And talking about companies that just gotten beat up for no reason, Another one that I bought um, this week was B2 Gold, which I never never owned because I always thought it was pricey and I thought it had a bit of risk in in Africa. But now they have that big project in Canada that they're building that I really like. And so, and B2 Gold, I mean, they pay like a six percent dividend, you and they're should. on and they're on sale. I mean, they ridiculously have gotten beat up. And, uh, so, and I'll probably add some more shares next week. It's like mm -hmm. I, like. It's like I said, people are nobody. Nobody loves the miners right now. But if you look at um, B2 Golds, if you look at their free cash flow and you look at their pipeline, it's a really solid company. I I like it a lot. I'm glad I glad I finally got in it. You got in at a pretty good price. I would imagine in the 250s. Yeah, Prince is a five bagger, which is if you can get a company of that size with five bagger. I mean, five bagger upside with a six percent dividend—that's crazy. I don't know of any other stock with a six percent well, div um, right. in the gold space that comes to mind. I mean, there are some that uh, are smaller, smaller names like you know um, that 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 those dividends are uh, questionable in my opinion. Like BTG. Um, I mean, Clive Johnson won co-CEO of the year in 2020. Like, this is not someone who's a rookie running the company. And um, their ASIC is quite low versus the peer group. So I don't know. I think, it, uh, like you, I mean, I'm, I'm not adding just yet. I'm holding what I have. Right. Um, but I, I, my cost is probably around like 350 and it's trading well below that. So I'm just going to hold, maybe add some if we get like a real, a real breakout on the GDX or J. Right. And... They, when they bought Sabina, they uh, they still have that royalty on that silver project, and I I just think that they're going to they're going to build that silver project. It's one of the best silver projects in the world, undeveloped, and uh, so th they're not getting any value for that. So uh, th that excites me that that royalty. Yeah. Who, it's a 22 percent roy NSR, which nobody can build that mine. Yeah. Nobody can build that silver mine without dealing with B2 and saying, 
you got to buy We have to buy that back from you. And they're like, no, you know, we're not selling it, but we'll buy your mind. They have huge leverage, a 22% NSR. I mean, it's, wow. it's, it's crazy. Have you looked at that? If that's, it's I didn't know it was that high. Yeah, 22% NSR, and it's like 200 million ounces of silver. It's a wow. Big silver project. Yeah, it's like, I don't know how in the world that, that company, I forget who, who has it, but they've, been, they, they've just been sitting on that thing ever since they, Sabina sold it. And so, yeah, 22% NSR. Crazy. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of things when you look under the hood, good and bad at some of these companies, and that's clearly a good. <laughs> Yeah. So, all right. Well, um, Don, as always, a pleasure. Uh, I will be in touch with you early April to set up our next one late April. Sounds good. Look forward right. to it. Have a good weekend. You too. Thanks, everyone.